So let's get into the learning. I'm primarily an educator. So I want to talk about and emphasize the role of learning in healing. So when we learn, we heal. When we learn, we build internal resources. We open up space for empathy and self-compassion. We begin to make sense to ourselves. So there's a huge role for psychoeducation as part of the healing process. I think that it's empowering and a massive relief and essential to help people understand themselves and the path that lies ahead. A lot of my career has actually been driven by this desire to make sure that the same information that is quite readily available to professionals is also made available to people who are living with the impact of trauma. So about six years ago, I created The Courage To Be Me, uh, which I'm incredibly proud of. This is an illustrated book that you can read in full for free online. And in the book, we follow a group of women as they begin or um, carry on with their own healing process. And one of the beautiful things about building something and putting it out there in the world is you think you've built one thing and then you put it out there and then you get a load of feedback about what it is you've actually created. So I didn't design this book as a resource to use with young people, but I get feedback from therapists that they're using it in that way. I also didn't really design it as a tool to use in therapy with your therapist, but I've heard from both clients and therapists of, you know, occasions where that's happened, where someone has brought the book into the session to point at a particular page or a particular element of it to kind of show how they're feeling or where they've been. So it's nice to know that, you know, these things are being used in different ways. I also hadn't really thought about creating something that would be useful for you know the other supporters who are you know the not professional supporters around a survivor so partners and parents but i've had some really lovely feedback from people that have said that this has really helped them understand what the person they're caring for is going through and to, and to see it differently and have a bit more space around it so that was about six years ago now um the sequel will be with us in a few weeks uh, i hope um the sequel is called how do people heal from trauma and um, I want to um, talk uh, a little bit about some of the thinking behind it, because the, the thinking kind of speaks to, you know, a lot of our learning about how do you do psychoeducation um, and how do you do it effectively? And I think how do people heal from trauma? Unfortunately, with a global pandemic happening right now is increasingly going to be a question that more and more people are asking whether that is trauma because of a history of sexual harm or trauma because of prolonged stress, um, trauma because they're a key worker, um, you know, lots more bodies are holding lots more trauma, um, unfortunately, at the moment. So how do people heal from trauma is effectively an online course. Uh, that's the technology that we're using. There's a series of pre-recorded videos, lots of worksheets, and it's all there that people can go through in their own time but we're calling it an online learning retreat because we want to emphasize the difference between passively consuming information and actively placing yourself in a conscious way in a learning to heal space. Um, and I want to share some, some more aspects of it because I think it might again be useful for your work. Another element to this course is that half of the retreat is about understanding trauma what happened as a consequence of what happened to you. And I think that's really important that we help people understand it. But the other half is um, dedicated to understanding what all of that means for a healing process. So people don't just need to understand what trauma is and what the impact is. We need to paint a picture of healing for them. We need to explain why yoga might be useful or explain how sound therapy and why sound therapy might be a useful part of uh, their toolkit. So this content really is a, a how do people heal piece of content rather than what is trauma and how might it be impacting you and how um, might you be struggling. Another aspect to this particular resource that's different is that it's been designed for both professionals working in the sectors, uh, be that support workers, ISVAs, therapists, and people who are living um, with the long-term impact trauma themselves. So service users, survivors. Um, and that's been a very conscious choice. 
Of course, there's a huge overlap between those two groups, um, but that isn't the main part of our thinking. The main part of our thinking is that we all need the same information. It, learning isn't just there for the therapists, it is part of the healing journey. And we're all on a shared journey, like we are all holding traumas. They may not be um, because of sexual harm, but all of our bodies are holding trauma to some degree or another. So we are all on this path, we're all on this journey, but we might have um, different starting places. So it's going to be useful to have a shared language, a shared map, even though we all have to find our own path. So I'm really curious, having not created the courage to be me very consciously as a, um, something that people might take into therapy, I'm, re I'm really curious to um, hear back from therapists and from um, survivors who are using it in this way, like both, both parties having um, been through the material and, and sharing that as part of the therapy process. I think the emphasis on learning and healing is especially important when we're talking about harm that's caused because of structural issues in society, because that learning helps people place their trauma in context. Um, it helps people understand how those structures helped to cause their trauma and how those structures might be keeping them in a traumatized place. And one of the good things that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK this summer is the Free Black University. And I smiled when I saw that they've got a similar approach. They see education and healing from structural racism as impossible to separate. Like they go hand in hand. Um, and I completely agree. You have to support people to heal as you educate them and educating will be supportive in a healing process. And when we think about the education of professionals in this space, in this, uh, space I smile again at a shift in my own thinking. I used to think I was doing a really good job um, at, by you know, every single time I had a training session, regardless of who it was with, I would always end that session with a note on self-care. Now just raise that, don't forget this is really important given that you do this for a living. And um, that was the best I had at the time. Um, but today that does feel a bit inadequate on many levels or maybe the kind of thing to say to myself is that my learning has progressed and I find myself in a different place with that. And perhaps there's nothing like a global pandemic to emphasize the importance of our own well-being as we perform our various roles in this space. Because the extent to which we're internally and externally resourced to do this work healthily is the extent to which we're all able to work with impact with others. Our own well-being needs to be central to our professional practice, not on the side, not at the end, not an afterthought, central to how we do this work. I'd also actually also right now changed the emphasis I placed in the past on self-care. We're all on our different journeys with the learning material. So this just reflects where I am at the moment and where I am is like, feeling increasingly uncomfortable about the extent to which we point to self-care. We seem to do it an awful lot with professionals in the space. So we, we, for service users, we're providing support, we're providing external contextual support. But for the professionals in the space, it's, it seems to be a, a little bit too much of an emphasis on self-care. And again, perhaps there's nothing like a global pandemic where we find ourselves more isolated than usual to emphasize the importance of connecting with others and being supported by others. Because none of us can self-care our way out of our traumas. We need internal resources, that's a really important part of the journey. But ultimately, we need to connect with others. We need external relationships, we, we need support from others, and we only need to look at the trauma literature to, to know that. So for me, certainly the term Self-care is uh, like something I feel like I'm using a lot, a lot less at the moment. Yes, in terms of radical self-care, it is a radical, political, beautiful choice to love yourself in a society that tells you you are unlovable. Um, but I don't think that's actually how we are too often using it in what I would call the sector. Okay, a, another lesson from the road. And this is one I'm really grateful to have figured out. And I think it's one of those lessons that maybe can only be learnt after having done something for years. And really it's a lesson born out of failure and disappointment. Um, 
but I'm going to spare you the gory details about that and kind of get to the, the take home message. Um, what I used to do or how I used to deliver training is, you know, invariably it would be um, criminal justice professionals. It would be one day where quite a lot of them, like maybe 100, 150 people uh, in a room for the day and they're having, uh, you know, a, a once a year masterclass um, on, on doing this work and I would parachute in as the expert, um, do my thing, which I'm sure I did great, <laughs> but I would do my thing and I would leave and I would get good feedback. But really, like really, would those individuals remember anything that I said six months later and, you know, as a psychologist and, you know, I'm not a police officer, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a barrister, I'm not a judge, I'm not a healthcare practitioner. So really my ability to translate the material into their world, like, is that good enough? Um, so these days I'm much less likely to use the word training, although I appreciate it's the language that a lot of other people understand in this space, but I, I prefer the idea of collaboration so my preferred way of working at the moment is for people to have access to pre-recorded video content over, you know, a year, whatever, have, have access to it all the time because goodness knows when you might want to refresh your memory. Um, so let's use technology, especially now as we're, we're kind of at the moment, I feel like we're being forced to, techno to use technology. But um, I, for me, this is a good move. This is a very welcome move because we can genuinely talk about continuing professional development, providing people with a permanent learning experience, not, not a one hit wonder. And so access to material all the time. But then when we come together, let's break down that material through a period of time and let's have a seminar. Let's have a case study. So I'm delivering some work this week with the Judicial College here in England and Wales. And I'm really happy that they've agreed to shift how we do that work. So rather than going in and doing my set piece, um, we've got a case study to work through. I'm going through it as a psychologist. Um, one of my colleagues is going through it as a judge. And then um, we're going to have a conversation about what the directions would be, what the psychology would say, and we're going to collaborate. And I feel like that approach is, you know, it gives me hope that we'll be able to work towards having the kind of understanding and the kind of nuanced um, uh, way of working with the material that this space needs in, in order for us to progress, in order for this sector to progress to the next level. So imagine that again with, with police officers, you know, having seminars, opportunity to ask questions, but a year long program. So whether you're um, commissioning professional development work for your teams or you're providing that service to others, I think now is definitely a moment for us to really think about how are we nurturing talent in this space? How can we genuinely invest in people's professional development instead of giving them the impression that all they need is, you know, 40 minutes of, of someone giving a talk? Um, and, and how can we make that happen over the year? And, and technology makes that easier. It makes it more affordable. And I'm actually, one of the things I'm really excited about is the kind of collaboration that's possible using technology, like to get police officers from different forces regularly coming together to share good practice. That's the kind of stuff that I think is possible. And again, in survivor support organizations, I know lots of you struggle to come together as a team just within your own organization, but it's it's feasible that, you know, if there were individuals within your team you really wanted to nurture, they could be regularly meeting with others from other organizations, thanks to technology. Okay. Another big change for me, this is one I have, like, literally, this is 180 degrees. I would have said the exact opposite thing about seven years ago if I was in front of you, which is, you know, um, don't preach to the choir. Um, and I think it was the right thing to say at the time. Um, I think there has been a moment in this space where it wasn't appropriate to, to preach to the choir because it felt like the job was to convince other people that sexual harm is important, that domestic violence is happening, and we need to get out there, we need people to listen and to realise that this is a problem. Um, and so under those circumstances, we all probably had the same message, which was, hey, take note of this, this is really a, prob a problem. But of course, thank goodness, the world has moved on. Uh, the messages we need to go out there with are a lot more sophisticated these days. So we work a lot with um, universities. 
And, you know, somebody who is a, a student activist 10 years ago um, would have been just raising awareness of this. These days, that student activist might well be a woman's officer and be invited to sit around a table and be invited to contribute ideas in, in terms of, well, OK, as a university, what are we going to do about sexual harassment on campus? So this is an excellent time to not preach, obviously collaborate with the choir, but we need to make sure we are nurturing the talent that is closest to these topic areas because the job they're being asked to do and the spaces that they've now got access to has changed and they need support. And so I feel like um, those of us who are active in this space, who are in positions like me, need to make sure that they are spending a fair bit of time with the choir these days. That's one of the reasons why at the Consent Collective, we recently um, started offering um, support work to survivor organizations so that we can spend time with those teams contributing to their professional development. One of the things we've been doing is holding space where we can collectively come together and have really heartfelt conversations about justice, about healing, about pleasure and boundaries and white supremacy and all of these things that is so important that we are able to um, collaborate on to talk about because you know we're all on a learning curve and that learning curve has to continue for um, ourselves and also for the space so this is really important so we've understood that um, learning and education is is an important message and, and it can be part of healing and you know so this is what we need to do it's also very important for us to understand that the world is never going to be changed by PowerPoint. I see this in so many different kind of public awareness campaigns. It's as if people think that all people need is the right information and then all these other things will change. Um, and that's a beautiful idea, um, but it's actually not true. We need to use nuanced ways, sophisticated ways of helping people learn. Because as human beings, we learn through storytelling, we learn through emotion, we learn uh, through humor. Um, and also people need to hear from other people who look like them and sound like them and not just the expert who with the PowerPoint presentation. We're going to need um, a collective response to this. And so this is very much part of the thinking behind the Consent Collective. Um, when we go onto university campuses, uh, we take our game show with us. It's a game show podcast but we also do it live on campus. It's called How To Be Good In Bed. This is the way in which we talk about consent on, on campus. We've also got loads of cooking shows. We use poetry. I've always used illustration in my work. Um, we use comedy. We get comedians to come in and be guests on the game show. We need to be using these kinds of tools if we want to engage people in conversations about consent. This isn't just about information. It's about culture and, you know, often when we have these kinds of uh, conversations, we talk about the power of a, of a TV show with a particular storyline and that's exactly it. That's, that's more powerful than uh, experts with PowerPoint presentations. So we need to get creative. We need to take, uh, take the work into those spaces too. Because trauma, unfortunately, now is already mainstream. So we need to make sure that we're helping get messages that are about healing and that they can become mainstream too. PowerPoint isn't mainstream, but, but getting out there with content that is using culture is a way to make it part of general conversation. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, let's open it up to questions.